So, so uh, Barnabas and John go one way. Paul chooses Silas. Again, we don't know a whole lot about Silas. He was one of the chief men of the brethren in Jerusalem. Uh, trusted fellow. Everybody liked him. But he was strong in the Lord and a good companion uh, for Paul. And so, uh, and we'll see that in the days ahead. And so Paul chooses Silas and they head upward into the Cilicia area. You see this now uh, on, on this second missionary journey. They're heading, uh, they went back up to Antioch and then they leave from Antioch and head into the Cilicia area uh, back to a place called Lystra and Derby. And what happened at Lystra? Yeah, the first time that they were there was not pretty. Okay, and Paul got stoned. Uh, yeah, well, I won't go funny. Uh, but he got stoned. You know what I mean? He got, yeah, okay, and he, he, would, he died. Okay, he died. And, uh, and so he was caught up in the third heaven, saw things he couldn't talk about, came back, God said, I'm not finished, and he rose up from that pile of death. And kind of, I can just only imagine this in my mind. I someday hope, Kind of a cool idea here. That maybe when we get to heaven, God has a screen set up. You know? You know, not us, but, but for, so we can sit and watch what happened, you know, actually see it as it happened, you know? And because uh, I'd like to I'd like to see what really happened in that whole thing. But Paul's dead. I mean, they looked at him and said, He's dead. He's doorknob dead. And and people were surrounded and he got up, walked back into the city, kept on preaching. Now they go right back to there, and this time he finds somebody in Derby, in Lystra area, by the name of Timotheus, chapter 16 and verse 1. Now, this again, last week, this is some of last week, trying to just catch you up here if you weren't here. But Timothy would become Paul's son in the faith. He would become Paul's uh, uh, protege. Paul would be his mentor. He chose this young man. His mother... Her name was Eunice. Her grandmother's name, his grandmother's name was Lois. And uh, they, they had very, very great faith, sincere faith. The unfeigned faith is told in Timothy of your mother and grandmother. And they had passed that along to Timothy. And he was a good young man. But his father was a Greek. And I'm just thinking out loud that maybe there was some kind of a deal struck between Timothy's mama and, and the daddy, uh, maybe he said, okay, you can teach him the law of Moses. Go ahead, go to the temple, synagogue, whatever you do. Let the boy memorize some of that. That's fine, whatever. He's just not getting circumcised. I kind of feel like that's what was the thing because he's, he's my boy and, he, and, and Greek blood's throwing, uh, flowing through his veins. He's not going to get circumcised. So, so he wasn't circumcised. So when Paul decided, by the help of the Holy Spirit, that, hey, this young man has some great potential, I want him to go with me. Kind of got it cleared with Mama and, and, and I don't know about Daddy, but at least maybe Mama and, and Grandmama. And the first thing he does is he circumcises him. Okay? Now, that seems a little odd when you compare it to the fact in Acts chapter 15, a whole chapter almost given up to the Jerusalem Council talking about this very thing of circumcision. Now, con concerning him being circumcised, this, this may sound confusing because in, the, because in that prior chapter, the Jerusalem Council railed, Paul railed against those who were trying to compel Greeks to be circumcised. But remember this. This was a different thing. This wasn't a matter of salvation. It was a matter of missionary strategy. Let that sink in for a moment. What, this wasn't about salvation. Young man was saved, circumcised or uncircumcised. But, and Brother John uh, mentioned to me, the other last, was it last Wednesday night? We were talking about this for just a moment. And uh, we were talking about expediency. Paul knew that this young man, as they would continue their journey, that they would encounter Jews. And they would go into temples. And no Greek, no Gentile, no uncircumcised person was allowed inside the temples. And so uh, Paul said, look, we, we, I want him to have that access so that he can stand by me and be with me wherever we go. And for the cause, for the sake of expediency. That's an important word. In fact, it's used in the Bible. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.12, Paul said, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says this, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So we know that there are some matters of life that are just a matter of expediency. It's, uh, it's not a commandment. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, as we said before, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things we talk about. Um, didn't Paul say, and I didn't write this down, but he did say in one place that he became all things to all people yeah. so that they could have the gospel, you know? So, I mean, if I, you know, so I was talking to uh, a missionary today and one of the ministries that he has is, uh, is a basketball ministry where he's at. And, and so, you know, uh, he could get out there on the court with a suit and tie, you know, and, but that's not expedient, right? So he, he puts on his T-shirt, T-shirt, long shorts, or T-shirt, long shorts, and basketball shoes, and, and gets out there and plays with them boys, and, and they shoot balls, and that gives him a chance to connect with them fellas. You see what I'm saying? Amen. I mean, uh, we need to find ways to, to break... <coughs> To tear, down, to tear down walls between us so that we can communicate the gospel. Again, we're not talking about trying to pile up with unbelievers. Right. We're trying to win non-believers. That's right. Does that make sense? We talked about the difference. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know the truth. They need to know the truth. And maybe if I can put on a pair of tennis shoes or, or, you know, or whatever it takes to try to get into a position where I can talk to him about the Lord. That's what he was trying to do for John Mark. I mean, for uh, Timothy, you see. That's pretty simple in my mind. Do you get it? Yeah. And so sometimes it's just a matter. And that's why he said there in verse 3, after that he circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in that, those quarters, because they knew his father was a Greek. So Timothy was making a clean break with uh, paganism. And uh, with his father's religion. And now he was fit to go into temples to be beside uh, Paul as he preached. And so this was necessary for him and it was expedient for him. Now, tonight, um, we begin to see in the next verses, and I'm just going to go through verse 11, verses 6 through 11. All right. And uh, let's read them and then we're going to discuss some things. All right. Verse number 6. Now, they have just... Uh, Paul circumcised uh, Timothy, verse 4 says they went to the cities, delivered them the decrees. Verse 5 says, so were the churches established in the faith, increased in number. Now, verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, now listen carefully, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, that's Asia Minor. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. Now, if you mark your Bible like I do, and if you like, you, I, I, would, I would encourage you to mark the word or circle the word forbidden in verse 6, forbidden. And then in verse 7, uh, the phrase suffered them not. Suffered them not and forbidden. Now, there were some things that... that um, that Timothy is going to have to learn. Paul's going to have to try to teach him some things as they go along. And, uh, and here's something that, that this young Timothy is going to have to learn. Uh, and all of us should learn. And that is we need to learn how to be led or moved by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, this is not an easy subject. I know that you know that you have the Holy Spirit living within you. If you're saved, you have. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you're saved, you have the Spirit of Christ. He lives within you. But I have to ask you, how often in a day's time or a week's time do you stop for a moment and say, wait a minute, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do right now? Um, I was planning on doing this, but what, what, what do you want me to do? Did you know there have been times I've been sitting in my study and I have a things to do list. I, I'm a things to do list guy. I, I'm serious, and there's a lot of reasons for it. One of the reasons is that I can't remember everything. So I write that stuff down. Got to get this accomplished, right? 
You ever do that? So every day I got a long list. And so uh, I try to prioritize what, what's got to be done, what's most important, do that, do that, do that. Then I try to work it down, weed it out. I might be down my list and thinking about this or that, and I said, ah, I need to get that done. And, and so I'm about to go there. It seems like I, I, sometimes I, I have to stop and say, wait a minute, is that priority? What about it, Holy Spirit? You know, what about it? How, how, you know, maybe the Spirit will stop you from the inside. By the way, at the time of this writing, okay, um, the Holy Spirit evidently did speak through these prophets. The, whole, the Holy Word was not yet finished. The Bible was not yet finished. So they still had prophecies, revelations, words of knowledge. So maybe somebody then would say that. But today, let's talk about today. How does the Spirit lead you or move you? Uh, there's a verse in Romans 8, 1 that says this, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, who walk according to the Spirit, where the Spirit of God wants you to go. Amen. Now, I want you to think about that. And honestly, um, life gets so busy, and we, and we don't really think about, I mean, we just do. I mean, it's there in front of us, so let's get it done, and, and we don't always think. Um, it's important for us to stop every so often and, and take a little evaluation, you know, a little inventory, and say, wait a minute, am I wasting my, my life on, on minors and missing the majors and leaving no time for the majors? What about it, Holy Spirit? What is it I need to do? Like I might say, boy, I really need to uh, work on this certain project, and it's important to me, and and I feel like it's important to God. I'm, I, and then God kind of whispered, wait a minute, uh, uh, Gwen's in the hospital. Right? Uh, somebody needs a call. Somebody needs a visit. And I, I kind of have to say, okay, wait, okay, okay, you're right. It's, the Holy Spirit didn't talk and talking to me, but he puts that on my heart. Right. And, it, and I see in my mind it, it, that, that, you know, this, this is far more important, this one, than this one. Now, sometimes we don't always know these things. Paul didn't know why he was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to, to go uh, into the area of Galatia, which is uh, north. You see it on your map. Instead, they head west, but they could have gone up into Galatia there and uh, toward the Black Sea uh, where, our, where our drone is tonight. <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, they... Uh, Y'all knew that, right? China bumped our drone and it went down. Okay. Um, so anyway, he didn't know, but he was forbidden to do that. Now, how, how do you think the Holy Spirit? Let's just let's put your thinking cap on. I know this in the Sunday school class, but it is a teaching time. How, do you, how, how does the Holy Spirit direct our movement sometimes? I kind of think about that for a moment. Anybody? What, what might the Holy Spirit do to redirect us or stop us from going somewhere doing it? Put it in your mind. Yeah, put it in your mind, in your heart. You know, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ. What else, somebody? Somebody, raise your hand when you talk. Okay, yeah. Yeah. You know, this is so important. An uneasy feeling. I love this because, you know, the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Yeah. Uh, let him, the word rule means to play umpire. <laughs> and if you take a step, the Holy Spirit says, you're out! <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have done that, you know. Or if you go the right direction, he says, you're safe. Let him play umpire. Um, let him rule. That's good, that peace. Where there's no peace, don't, don't move forward when there's no peace. Amen. You better stay back, okay? How else might the Holy Spirit... By putting an obstacle in your path. Now, that's, that's where we're at. I mean, it's it, really the word here, when we think about this word, forbidden means to stop with pressure, as if, as if all of a sudden he's hit something, something bigger than him. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt that in your life where you was doing something, just felt like God just put a, a wall up against you, just wasn't that just what we, we talked about the closed doors and the open doors. Now, here's the way I pray when I'm asking God for His will, and, and, and I have for years, and that is, God, look, I, I want to go forward. It looks like a good door. It, it looks like it's open to me, so I'm going to head toward it. And if it's not your will, close the door. 
Amen. Make it known to me. Just close the door. Let me bump my noggin on it. And understand it's not your will for me to go through that door. Amen. See? Amen. So sometimes finding the will of God is that way. And that's what that word forbid means. It just means to step, to stop with pressure. Suffered them not means would not permit them. There just was no permission. Okay? Uh, a preacher once said the Christian ought to live in the green light waiting for the red and not in the red light waiting for the green. So I think what this preacher was saying was that Christians ought to be moving, working, doing, and as we move forward, allow God to stop us or redirect us according to His will. So God does stop us. He does redirect us from time to time in various ways, open and close doors, the unsettling of the mind that was mentioned. I wrote that down. No peace. I wrote that down. A friend's advice, a message by the pastor. I mean, you hear a message, you think, wow, that sure, God's trying to tell me something. So uh, listen for those things. So Timothy needed to know that. He needed to learn how to be moved by the Holy Spirit. Number two, Timothy would have to learn how to be motivated by vision. By vision. Look at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go unto Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. The words, a straight course, is a nautical term. It means that the wind was behind them, and they sailed quickly across that little stretch that there on your mount from Troas over into the Macedonian area, that little stretch of of sea right there. And they got there quickly. What might have taken, you know, three or four days, took just one day, and they got there quickly. The wind was behind them, okay? But my point, this point is this. Um, we're talking about being motivated by a vision. So Paul gets this vision. Now in the Bible, God reveals himself or his will in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, let me regret. In the Old Testament, he would, he would reveal his will many ways through prophets, of course, but sometimes through a dream. Now, a dream would be God revealing himself while you're asleep, obviously. Okay? And visions. And that would be God revealing himself or his will while you're awake. All right? Now, who can you think of somebody in the Old Testament who, who, uh, who saw who had a dream and God revealed his will or encouraged him uh, through a dream? Joseph. 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 Samuel. Samuel. Jacob. Remember Jacob's ladder? These are all dreams, okay? And these are ways God it reached them and communicated his will. Uh, we think about God doing that while they're awake. Uh, John the Revelator was awake on the Lord's Day when he got that vision, that revelation. Uh, uh, Peter was awake on the rooftop Got that vision, the big sheet let down and all the animals. So God was revealing himself through those means. Now, how does God reveal his will to us today? Primarily, basically, his word, his word. Okay. And so uh, that's why we call the Bible the revealed will of God. Amen. Amen. The revealed will of God. That's first and foremost. Now, so, so, but, but. And I'm fixing to use a verse that, and I'm going to use it a little out of context. I know what I know; it's a little out of context, but it's still true. The verse that says in Proverbs twenty nine twenty nine eighteen, where there is no vision, vision the people perish. perish. Now we know that in that verse, the word vision is talking about the word of God, because where there is no word of God, there is no revelation of God to people; they perish. Yeah. That's really the, the the meaning of that verse, but. I don't think it'd be out of line to use it like this also. That if you don't have a vision for people, a vision for, for your life, I mean, if you can't see past yourself and look into the future in your mind's eye and, and think about how God might want to use you and how, how, how the church needs uh, your guilt and how souls need to hear the gospel and, and having a vision. If you don't have that, people are going to perish. Okay? 
That's why we're talking about revival. That's why we're talking about getting right with God and making sure that we're doing all in our power to get the, the gospel out. All of these things because we need a vision for lost souls, a vision. I heard a preacher preach a long message one night. I won't tell you the preacher, but anyway, uh, like a two-hour message talking about a vision. This was many, many years ago. Talking about having a vision of hell, a vision of heaven, a vision of lost souls, a vision for the church, a vision of for... In other words, just having your mind activated Something that motivates you, you know. And, and I think that's important for all of us to have that, you know. Don't get lazy on God. It's, it, it's a lazy Christianity that just wants to just come, sit, plop down, get fed, and leave. That's, that's a lazy, fat sheep mentality. Right? Just feed me and I'll... No, take what you hear, the Word of God. Take what you... The messages, the singing, let it motivate you. Let it have a vision. When I think about a vision, there's one passage of Scripture that just moves me every time. It's one of my favorite in the New Testament. It's in Matthew 9, verses 36 to about 41, where, where Jesus is looking out across the mountainside, and the Bible says he was moved with compassion. The crowd, there were so many people. And he was moved with compassion. He saw them as sheep having no shepherd. He looked past the dirt, the filth, the raggedness, the unkemptness. He, he looked past the, the diseases and past the leprosy and past the, the, all the, the, the junk. And he looked past all that. I mean, just sometimes we've got to look past stuff. We've got to look past filth and junk. And we think, man, I don't want near that person. Well, that might be the very person that needs you the most. Yeah. Right. And, and figure that out. Let God use you. But he was moved with compassion. He saw them as sheep. No shepherd wanted, really. They had no shepherd. He saw them as throwaways. You know? He looked past who they were and got a vision. You know, that's what I'm talking about. It, and that's the kind of vision we need, right? And that's the kind of vision that Timothy would need to keep him going. And then number three, and we're almost done. Timothy would need to learn... All this is important. I said first, how to be moved by the Holy Spirit. Second, how to be motivated by vision. But number three, how to be ministered to by others. How to be ministered to by others. Now, this is a subtle lesson uh, here, a subtle principle, but I want you to listen to it. Look at, look, look at this verse, uh, verse number uh, uh, nine. I'm sorry. Uh, verse, uh, keep going. Uh, okay, verse seven. Look at verse seven. After they were come, they. You see the word They. After they. Now who's writing this book we're reading? This, this book of Acts? Luke. Luke. Okay. So Paul's, and Luke's writing it and he says, and after they, verse 7, that's talking about Paul and Silas and Timothy. We're coming. And then look down at verse number 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we, you see that? Endeavored to go into Macedonia. So somebody has joined their group. Who is it? Luke. That's, Luke has joined their group. Now, what do we know about Luke? Okay. Well, we know that he was a non-Jewish believer. He was a Gentile believer, a Greek. He was not a part of the circumcision, according to Colossians 4.11. We know that. We know that he would become the writer of a gospel and the book of Acts, which is considerable. And then number three, we know something else about Luke. He is a doctor. Doctor, Dr. Luke, a physician. A physician. And so Paul called him that in Colossians 4.14, Luke, the beloved physician. Now, why would Paul and company need a doctor? <laughs> because both Paul and Timothy would have health issues, health problems. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, right? 2 Corinthians 12, pray three times about it. God said, no, 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 my grace is sufficient. I don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. Nobody really does. There's a lot of speculation. Maybe he had eye trouble. He talked about how big a letter he wrote in one place. Uh, maybe he had eye trouble, had, couldn't see well, wrote big letters. I don't know. Um, may, maybe he had epilepsy. Some have suggested that. Maybe he had, uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe it was his, his, his ailments and, and problems that, were, that stayed with him through that beating he got yeah. in Lystra. Even though God spared his life, he could have still... In fact, he talked about having scars. He bore scars in his own body. Mm -hmm. So he got up with scars. Maybe some of that, and he, he asked God, please take this away. Maybe, maybe 
a rock got, you know, hit him in the eye and his, his eyes were crooked or his nose was bent or, uh, you know, I don't know, something. And he said, God, would you fix that? And God said, no, no. And so he would need a doctor. And something was wrong with uh, Timothy too. Later on we find Paul writing to him in Timothy chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse 23. And I know it's a controversial verse. <laughs> he said, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. And thine often frequent infirmities. The word frequent, the word often means frequent. So I'm at Walmart years, years, years ago. When I first started here. And uh, one of my trustees <clears throat> I met at the grocery store, and he's around in a corner with a buggy. And I bet he's got six or seven uh, big, big wine bottles, wine, you know, bottles of wine in his, in his basket, you know. And the first thing out of his mouth was, oh, preacher, because, you know, I'm new here. He said, he said oh, preacher, he said, he said, oh, oh, he said, man, it's doctor's orders, doctor's orders. <laughs> And I reminded him, I said, remember, uh, Paul said, use a little wine. <laughs> For your stomach's sake, a little wine, okay? not a lot of it, okay? So uh, uh, whether we want to believe that is actual wine there in that passage or not, uh, it is the word oinos, but uh, we know today, we're smart today to know that grape juice gives you the same health benefits as, as wine does without the alcohol. Right. And so there was no need for Paul to be advocating him drinking alcohol. But he said, grape juice is good for your stomach, help you with your ulcer, help you with whatever it is you got going on in your stomach. And uh, so Paul, and, and, and I'm sure they learned that from Dr. Luke. So Dr. Luke would be a real handy guy on this trip and he would minister to them and Timothy would have to learn uh, to trust other people to, to help them. And here's my point, and we're done. Timothy would learn that God surrounds all of us with people who want to help us when we're down. Mm -hmm. Listen to this statement. I, I, I don't know, but there's some words that I write down, I think, where'd they come from? Timothy would learn that God surrounds all of us with people who want to help us when we're down or sick or depressed. Even preachers can fall into that same pit of sickness or depression. King David did, Job did, Elijah did, even Paul did. But ministers have a tendency to ignore their needs and isolate their problems. And many don't get the help they need because of foolish pride. Amen. Well, anyway, that's for the preachers. But we all <clears throat> need to realize that God puts people around us that want to minister to us. Let people minister to you. It ain't going to hurt them. Uh, it'll help them and help you too, right? Amen. And he would have to learn that. So there's some lessons for tonight. Father... We are so happy tonight, Lord, to know the Word of God, to have a copy.